Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for today's AIAA Los Angeles Las Vegas section uh, section meeting on October 12, 2021. Uh, we have a great event tonight with a, a, a series of great speaker and a very exciting topic. So, uh, so stay tuned, enjoy the event. Uh, before the presentation start, we have to logistic to go over. Uh, so first thing, our AWA headquarter for providing this nice Zoom platform. And also thank you for all the speakers to uh, allow us to record it. And uh, the recording and podcast will be posted after the event. Uh, just for the note, if your internet has some issue with bandwidth, you can use the dial-in in your email uh, and uh, just use the internet for the video. So if anything happened, please keep trying to reconnect. It should be just temporary. A few words about AIWA. Uh, AIWA is an organization, nonprofit, uh, promoting aerospace and uh, was headquartered in Reston, Virginia. Our um, Present is right now Mr. Basil Hassan, Executive Director, Mr. Dan Dunbacher, and uh, Section Chair, Dr. Jeff Puchel. Uh, he's with Raytheon, he's uh, uh, our AIWA Fellow. And uh, this is a little thing about AIWA. We are a national organization. We have international presence. We encourage international collaboration as well. If you join AIWA, a professional organization is good for your career, and uh, you got to, uh, to meet a lot of experts and uh, possible opportunities. Different level of membership, uh, as you can see here, professional, early career, students, educator, operate. Uh, for example, Blue Origin, SpaceX, they are all our corporate members. Um, once you join AWA, you can start to use Engage and uh, to connect with AWA members around the world. Now, every day, you got a daily launch for Insights Story, Aerospace America, every month, and you got great discount for attending AWA conference. And AWA publish and provide um, a fund for education, AWA Foundation, Industry Guide. Career Center as well. And AWA has, um, you can advance your ranks from senior member, social member, fellow, honorary fellow. Uh, for example, Dr. Bill Gersenmeyer is a former NASA human space flight director. He's now working with SpaceX, he's our honorary fellow. You can also get awards, Guggenheim, read awards uh, for your publication, uh, work, leadership, service, paper, student work, education, etc. A student can apply for scholarship, attend student conferences, uh, attend design, build, and apply contest. Ascent is next month, uh, very exciting in Las Vegas. Uh, online event, national five major forums. And uh, just a few words for Southern California. Uh, we have so many aerospace activities and companies, organization, NASA JPL, Northrop Grumman, uh, Raytheon, Aerospace Corporation was very big, uh, working with JPL, uh, with Dr. Chodas uh, on planetary defense. Uh, SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit, and uh, a lot of new, company, new companies, uh, like launcher space, relativity space, more 3D, uh, 3D printing rocket, and uh, Ampere for electric hybrid aircraft. LJ Rocketdyne, Honeywell, Boeing, Lockheed Martin. And uh, we keep doing events to keep everybody engaged uh, and uh, network together. Uh, just a word for next week event. It's also related to planetary defense. Uh, Dr. David uh, Levy is uh, the co-discoverer for the Shoe Shoemaker Levy 9 Comet 
is going to give a talk to us. So next Wednesday, 7 p.m. is highly related to planetary defense. Uh, we also have newsletter, and uh, this lady you see in the picture is Carolyn Shoemaker. She passed away uh, last month. She was one of the co uh, one of the discover discoverers for the uh, Shoemaker Living Nine. Um, so we also have podcast, YouTube video. Um, so, uh, sorry, I kind of missed the why here, but uh, so we have Dr. Tedda Koshini from ESA. Uh, they will introduce themselves and our mother, Nancy, Nancy uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Wolfson is going to say a few words as well. And uh, Dr. Yoshikawa from JASA and uh, uh, Ms. Nancy Wolfson, she's our moderator tonight. Uh, she's the president of Disrupting Space. And uh, Mr. Dan Masnek uh, from uh, NASA Langley. And uh, Alejandro, Mr. Roman from Paraguay Space Agency. Uh, so, um, so let's welcome all the speakers, uh, but especially uh, we, let's turn it to Nancy, uh, our moderator tonight. Uh, so Ms. Wolfson, Welcome and uh, go ahead. Thank you, Ken. And hello and greetings, everyone. This is Nancy C. Wilson. I will be your moderator and a speaker at the close to the end of the session. But today we have a very special session for everyone. And um, it's going to be a very dynamic presentation about planetary defense. But this is not just any presentation. Today we have representative for, from the major space agencies involved in planetary defense. Um, you will be learning from the experts about planetary defense and how you can help us protect our asteroids. So we are going to start with the first speaker, uh, Mr. Detlef. Detlef, <laughs> sorry. Koshni, <laughs> I'm still getting my pronunciation correct. So, he Nancy. is from the European Space Agency, Detlef. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, Detlef Korsnia is correct. And I'm the managing our planetary defense office that we have at the European Space Agency. You will hear some details in my presentation. Thank you. We're looking forward. And of course, we have Mr. Makora Yoshikawa from JAXA, which is the um, the Japanese Aerospace Agency, uh, Mr. Makoto. Hi, uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, I am Makoto Yoshikawa uh, from JAXA, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. And uh, I am mainly working for the uh, JAXA's uh, asteroid mission, like uh, Hayabusa and Hebsa 2. And now I am a mission manager of Hebsa 2. I am very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, we're very excited for your presentation. And of course, we have NASA, and today is joining us, Daniel Masanek from NASA. Daniel? Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Dan Masnick, and I am um, a senior space systems engineer at NASA Langley Research Center. I've been there um, for 32 years now, and for the past 20 years, been working a variety of planetary defense um, initiatives and, and missions. So looking forward to talking with everybody here tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. And of course, we always have representatives from everywhere, and one of the space agencies from South America that is joining us today is the Paraguayan Space Agency. And Mr. Alejandro Roman, will be joining us later. So what about if we start with this very exciting presentation of today with our first speaker, Mr. Deflect, please take it away. Yeah, okay, let's get the first challenge started here. That is share the right screen. So there we are. I will talk mainly actually about the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group and then in particular, of course, the involvement of the European Space Agency where I'm working at. I'm managing the Planetary Defense Office. Note the spelling, we use British spelling. So defense is spelled with a C here. You'll see a difference to 
our NASA colleagues here. The European Space Agency is currently chairing this Space Mission Planning Advisory Group, and that sounds like a fancy name. I will explain to you what this is because it's one of the important international bodies that we have to deal with this topic of planetary defense. But I'll come to that. Let me first give you a quick overview of the pillars, as we call it, of our planetary defense activities in the European Space Agency. We have currently about 15 people that work with us, plus support people for IT and software development, industry contracts that develop telescopes and other systems. And the if you work in the field of planetary defense, I think it's always a bit the same strategy that you want to follow. You first want to find these objects, you want to observe them. So the first pillar is observations and you see a typical telescope dome on the left. The second one is you want to compute the orbits and find out whether they have a possibility to hit our planet. We call that impact monitoring. This in our case is called information provision because it's more than that. We also have databases for the physical properties of asteroids, like what they are made of, how large are they? So that's this name. And then in the end, you want to do something about it. And that's something we call mitigation. In the simple case, you see a, 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 what we call the close approaches fact sheet on the upper right. It's our means to communicate, for example, with emergency response agencies, information about asteroids that come close to our planet. And then of course, there's the international context. So let's jump right into this part, the international context. Um, there was in, in the year 2014, we established two major groups on an international level. These groups have the task to deal with this topic of planetary defense. It used to be called the NEO threat or something like this. Now we just use the term planetary defense. After many years of discussing what should we be doing on an international level, it was decided to have the structure that you see here. We have something called International Asteroid Warning Network. Uh, that is a, a network, a loose agglomeration of teams of individuals that deal with this topic of uh, finding out where the objects are. So our observational activities would be a contribution to I1. They deal with the topic of what would be the effects of an impact and very important warning or generating warnings about potential impacts is the task of I1. On the right side, you see a group we call Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. That's a bit more restricted club where members of space agencies or space offices are participating. The task of same page is to think about what can a space agency do for protecting our planet from asteroids. And typically space agencies build space missions. So we can have a reconnaissance mission that just finds out uh, how big is the asteroid or we can actually try to deflect it. These groups report to something called COPUS. COPUS stands for Committee of Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. It's one of the committees of the United Nations. And USA stands for Office of Outer Space Affairs. That's the secretariat of this body. Uh, we regularly report both from I1 side and same page side to COPUS in a meeting in February every year in Vienna. Now, if we had something to tell the world in between, we simply address the Office of Outer Space Affairs directly. They then have diplomatic channels to inform different countries. What's the mandate of same page? Um, well, first thing is you can find all the information about same page on the web page, which is called smpag.net. And if you click on it, it expands to this. It's hosted by the European Space Agency. 
The purpose of the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group is to prepare for an international response to an NEO impact threat through the exchange of information, development of options for collaborative research and mission opportunities, and NEO threat mitigation planning activities. And for your reference, I listed the tasks. I'm not going to read them all to you, but uh, this gives you a bit more details there if you want to look at it in your own time. One thing I believe is interesting to say is one of the tasks, task number one, was to come up with thresholds and criteria. When should this group actually start planning? We did the same for I1, but uh, Dan will address I1 a bit more, so I focus on same page here. This group has to become active. It should start with mission options planning when warned of a possible impact, which is predicted to be within 50 years, an impact probability larger than 1%. And now the important thing, the size has to be 50 meters or larger. Basically, what that means, if you have an asteroid coming, which you think is smaller than 50 meters, you don't go there. You don't launch a very expensive space mission. We estimate that it's cheaper to take the hits and then maybe evacuate areas or do other mitigation measures on ground. I show you this picture again, because that's really the main message that you remember this graph, which shows you the setup with these two groups reporting to COPOS and USA. This is happening regularly. And as I mentioned before, if we have something to report in between these February slots when the committee meets, we simply address the Office of Outer Space Affairs directly. Now, two slides about what is ESA really doing in this group, or maybe it's three slides. One of the important things we're doing is we are participating in a mission where we want to demonstrate that you can actually deflect an asteroid. And there we also will hear more from, from the NASA colleagues. NASA will launch very soon a mission to hit an asteroid, the smaller one of a double asteroid system. And it's actually, in this case, it's the one in the front because this one looks like it has a hole in here. This is a graphical representation of what we expect to happen when the spacecraft hits the asteroid. It generates an impact crater. It generates ejecta that flies out and the, the push of this impact, the momentum is transferred to the asteroid and slightly moves the asteroid out of its previous orbit. And if you want to understand that properly, you have to go there and really look in detail after the fact at the impact crater. How does the surface look like? That's what we will be doing with the HERA mission, which is meant to launch in the year 2024. That's a big thing where we spend a lot of money. The other thing that we are doing is uh, more a theoretical work that we want to understand in case I have an object that could come very close to the earth or even hit us, there are different techniques to deflect it. Uh, like the, the really last resort, if an object is very close, if it's very large, would be a nuclear explosion. This concept of hitting an asteroid and, and like, you know, it's like a cosmic car accident, you know, that you push the asteroid away a bit. It's what we call kinetic impactor. And there are other techniques. Civil defense just means you take the hit. Now that happens for objects smaller than 50 meters. So in this diagram here, what we did now is our contribution to same pages. We looked at all the objects which we have in our so-called risk list which is the list of asteroids which could potentially hit our planet. Each dot represents one of these asteroids. <clears throat> and now we classified them according to this diagram and said, okay, these are objects that we could deflect with a kinetic impactor. And then we did a first preliminary mission analysis for that. That means we compute how do you actually get there? What's the, the amount of fuel you need to send a spacecraft there that lets you deflect it? So that's an important contribution which we expect to expand on also in the future. And last not least, ESA is, as I mentioned at the beginning, chairing right now this Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. 
Actually, this week we will have uh, two afternoons of meetings. For more details, have a look at the web pages. And with that, I thank you for your attention and conclude this presentation. Okay, um, I don't know if Nancy is gonna. Yeah, <laughs> I got it. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for that presentation. Very informative. And I do have to say that one of our speakers might not be able to join us today. So my apologies, but things happen, but we will continue. So- I'm here. Um, he is here. He is oh, here. Alejandro. Okay, great. Thank you. I made it. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so we are complete. <laughs> so allow me to introduce the next uh, speaker. And our first, I would like to say thank you to the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics for hosting this virtual planetary defense event 2021. We are still dealing with the pandemic but nothing can stop us. And we continue collaborating to bring planetary defense to everyone. So our next um, speaker will be Mr. Makoro Yoshikawa from the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. Mr. Makoro, are Hi. you with us? Yes, thank you. Thank okay. you Yes, okay. Uh, at first I share my screen. Just a minute. Okay. Okay. So uh, first of all, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this very uh, interesting event. I am very happy to talk about the uh, planetary defense in JAXA. And uh, uh, unfortunately. JAXA does not have a dedicated section for planetary defense, but uh, we have uh, some asteroid annual missions like uh, Hayabusa, Hayabusa 2 and its extended mission and Disney Plus. And also we observe, we observe NEO. And uh, uh, recently we developed new method to find the asteroid where uh, JAXA has DSA Space Guard Center. And we have a lot of international collaborations in JAXA's missions where we collaborate, collaborate with HERA and uh, uh, JAXA is one of the members of the same page. So today I'm going to talk about these things. So first I show uh, this uh, slide. Uh, this is uh, JAXA's asteroid explorations. We had Hayabusa, uh, the target asteroid was Itokawa, which is S-type asteroid. And then we had Hayabusa 2. Uh, the target uh, was Ryugu, which is a C-type asteroid. And actually Hayabusa 2 is now in, in the extended mission. And the a, a new target is 1998 KY26. Uh, this is a very small asteroid. I will talk about this later. And in future, uh, we are planning Disney Plus, uh, which is a, a Phaeton flyby mission. And uh, uh, MMX, this is not for the asteroid, but uh, it, it's a Phobos Sampleton mission. But anyway, Phobos is, looks like a, a small asteroid. Anyway, anyway uh, we, JAXA, uh, has these uh, missions. And uh, as you can see, all of these asteroids are NEOs. And uh, up to now, we studied Itokawa and Ryugu uh, quite in detail. And now uh, we know a lot of uh, physical uh, properties of these asteroids. I think uh, this is a very important for the planetary defense. Uh, this uh, shows the uh, mission scenario of Hypsa 2. Today, I will not talk about Hypsa 2 in detail, but uh, a six year uh, mission was quite successful and uh, uh, we did a lot of operations and everything was successful. 
and the last December, uh, Hayabusa 2 came back uh, to the to the Earth. Uh, this photo is a reentry capsule. Uh, it is like a, a very beautiful uh, fireball. And the left hand side, uh, this is a movie. You can see the capsule is moving in the uh, dark sky. Okay, and then when we opened the capsule, uh, we found uh, lots of samples of Itokawa. Above, this is a, a samples from first touchdown, and the, uh, uh, below, this is a samples from second touchdown. So in total, we have 5.4 gram, and uh, uh, now uh, we are doing the creation works, and then uh, initial analysis has started uh, from last June. And uh, uh, samples will be distributed to researchers around the world from June next year uh, by international AO. So like this, Hevsa 2 was uh, quite successful. And uh, this, these are uh, images of Ryugu. They are very nice images. Uh, the lower uh, left and the lower right uh, are the movies of touchdown. And the middle, uh, lower middle uh, images, these are uh, impact experiment. So today I talk about uh, this impact ex experiment in detail. Okay, so uh, this shows the impact experiment. The spacecraft went down to the altitude of about 500 meters. So I, I uh, uh, show a movie like this. Then uh, a CI, small carrying impactor was separated and it slowly uh, go, uh, went down to the surface. The spacecraft must quickly move and hide behind the asteroid because uh, a CI explodes 40 minutes later. But if spacecraft uh, uh, hide behind the asteroid, we cannot see the impact experiment. So uh, before hiding the asteroid, behind the asteroid, the spacecraft uh, separates this small camera. Uh, we call this a uh, D-cam, deployable camera. And this camera can observe uh, the impact event. So uh, this uh, mission was very uh, complicated, but uh, uh, it, it was a great success. So now I show you a real image. So uh, at first, impactor exploded uh, 300 meters above the surface. And then uh, you can see uh, ejecta uh, from the surface of Ryugu like this. And uh, this is a movie. So uh, we can see how the uh, crater grows. This is a very nice uh, movie. And uh, the right figure shows the accuracy. Uh, this cross is a target point, and this circle is a collision point. So uh, the error was just 20 meters. And uh, this is an uh, actual crater. Uh, the size is about 15 meters in diameter. Uh, before this experiment, we, we thought the size of the crater is uh, maybe uh, uh, around three meters or so, but actually uh, the real size was much larger than we had expected. So uh, this is a very small experiment, but if it can be scaled up. Uh, it can also be applied to the to change the orbit of asteroid. After a six years uh, six year tra space travel, Hayabusa two spacecraft was still healthy, and uh, fifty percent of Zeno uh, uh, is was remained. So we planned the extended mission. The selected target. Uh, was 1998 KY26. This is a very small asteroid. The diameter is about three, 30 meters. And the uh, uh, spin period is around uh, 11 minutes. So uh, uh, this asteroid was discovered 
by Space Watch Project. Uh, such asteroids have never been visited by spacecraft, and we think this is a very interesting object, not only uh, from the science, but also uh, from the planetary defense. And the problem is uh, it will take about 10 years to reach this asteroid. Uh, the ar arrival year is 2031. So we hope the spacecraft will last for another 10 years. Before arriving, KY26, uh, we have one asteroid flyby, uh, 2001 CC21, and uh, two Earth swingby. So it will be a very long journey. Okay, so this is the Hayabusa 2. And then I quickly show this uh, uh, slide. Uh, th this is a collaboration with HERA. Uh, JAXA uh, will provide a thermal infrared imager, TD, to HERA. Uh, this camera, this infrared, infrared camera, uh, was uh, used in Hayabusa 2, and uh, it will be mo modified for uh, HERA. So now PDR has been finished, and we have started to make uh, a, a EM, engineering model. And another thing is uh, uh, observation of NEO. Uh, this, this slide shows the uh, newly developed method to find a very faint, fast moving object. Uh, this uh, method was developed by Dr. Yanagisawa. Uh, we take a lot of images, very short exposure images, and uh, 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 assuming various motions, uh, we overlap these images and uh, find fast moving object. So the theory is very uh, simple, but uh, uh, we need a lot of calculation. So we uh, developed a PGA and uh, 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 we had many test observation. And uh, this is a list of uh, discovered NEO by this method. We just use very small telescope, this one, this one, uh, uh, the size is 18 centimeter or 25 centimeter, very small. But uh, we uh, uh, were able to find these uh, small uh, object like this. So we think this method is very effective. So finally, I just show you this slide. Uh, JAXA has a BCA space center. Uh, it has one meter telescope and a 50 centimeter telescope. The main work is to observe uh, space debris, but uh, it also observes NEOs. So now we are trying to incorporate the stacking method into the BCA Space Earth Center. Okay, so that's all. Uh, this is a quick summary of JAXA's activity for planetary defense. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Makara. That was a very interesting presentation. And thank you for joining us today. As we continue, we have a lot of surprises for you. So don't go anywhere. And now, Daniel Masanek will be joining us uh, from NASA. Daniel, how are you doing? Are you ready? I'm ready. Thanks, Nancy. Can, can everybody hear me OK? Yes, we can hear you. Please take it away. OK. All right, so I'm going to go a little bit uh, discussion about NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office, um, a little bit about the activities in the United States, and a little bit about the search programs um, that we've got going on, as well as say a few words about uh, Iwan and Saint Page and also uh, mitigation techniques. So I'm going to go ahead and share my share my uh, slides with everybody, if I can do that with the right window. Um, okay, hope everybody's seeing that. Yes, good. Okay, great, thanks for the confirmation. Um, so, <clears throat> just
just to start off, the Planetary Defense Coordination Office um, at NASA was established in 2016, and um, it was it was um, instituted to manage the planetary defense related activities across NASA and also coordinate both within the United States, um, different agencies within the US, as well as international efforts to study and plan a response to the asteroid impact hazard. Obviously, this is a global um, concern and, uh, and NASA is, is a leader in, in, um, in this effort. And basically the mission statement is to detect any potential for significant impact of the planet by natural objects, uh, array, appraise the range of potential effects of that potential impact, and then also just develop uh, strategies to mitigate um, the impact effects on human welfare. So this, this chart kind of, I, I like it because it graphically shows how the different uh, aspects of planetary defense um, shape up. And we've got everything, if you start in the upper right, we've got search, detect, and track. And so we do that with space-based and ground-based observations. And of course, the International Asteroid Warning Network um, provides the international uh, clearinghouse for, for those observations and the communications. It, it doesn't do any good just to detect and track them. We've also got to characterize so we've got to understand the physical characteristics of the asteroids. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation. Um, you know, at, at first they're just little points of light in the sky, but there's a lot of information in that, in that light. Um, we can get spectral imaging um, and get uh, information about their size characteristics um, as well as their composition. And then we've also got to plan and coordinate efforts. And that's, for example, same page is one of those, those activities of, um, of doing some of the mission planning. And then we've got to mitigate, as, as Detlef uh, started talking about, and we've got everything from um, the, the double asteroid redirect test that I'll talk about a little bit later and um, federal emergency management um, exercises that we do. And then we've got the, the assessment, um, the CNEOs, the Center for Near Earth Object Studies out at JPL as part of NASA, to assess the uh, the impact threat, um, their orbits, et cetera. And then we've got the International International Astronomical Union Minor Planet Center as a clearinghouse for, for observations. So um, back in 2018, so not too many years ago, about three years ago now, the uh, White House released guidance for a national near-Earth object preparedness strategy and action plan. And if you go to the link on the on the on the slide here, you can uh, download the PDF version of the report and it'll give you a good information about all the aspects of it. I'll just summarize it here. Um, there's a 10 year action plan that was recognized that we needed to enhance our NEO detection characterization and tracking capabilities, um, improve our modeling um, and our predictions so that we can, uh, we can understand the impact of, of effects as well as integrate that information um, develop technologies for neo deflection and disruption. We'll talk a lot about deflection, but disruption is another um, form of mitigation that can be effective if, if used properly. Um, increase international cooperation on neo pre preparation and establish the emergency procedures and protocols that, that are needed uh, in the event that there is an actual uh, impact threat. So just a few words about NASA's um, NEO search program. Some of the current survey systems uh, includes a series of ground-based telescopes, uh, Catalina Sky Survey at University of Arizona, the PanSTARS out at University of Hawaii, um, Maui, the uh, Atlas Telescope also in, um, in Hawaii, and, um, and the linear SST. And um, so you can see the sizes of these telescopes. They're, they're some of them are, you know, sub meter telescopes and some are a little bit larger. Um, we've also got NEOWISE, which is a, a uh, orbiting spacecraft that was originally, that's been repurposed to look for near Earth objects. When it was the WISE spacecraft, um, uh, it, it did a lot of survey of, in the infrared of asteroids, galaxies, and, and faint stars. Um, but, but now it's been repurposed for the past several years and kind of scheduled to go out until 2023 at least um, to support NEO searches. So just a little bit of, of um, information about discoveries. So 
if you look at this chart, it shows there's three colors. One is all of the discoveries um, that have been made to date uh, through the, the search program. The orange shows the 140 meter or larger objects and the, the kind of orangish red shows the one here, we actually broke through the, the, the catalog that we have 25,000 um, near-Earth asteroids that have been cataloged. And, and you can see that we've got about 10,000, um, almost 10,000 that, that are 140 meters or greater. And there's nearly 900 that are greater than one kilometer. So um, back in 2005, they, we instituted the George E. Brown Jr. Um, NEO survey goal, and that was to find 90% uh, of the potentially hazardous uh, asteroids, the 140 meter and larger that could impact the Earth um, by the year 2020. And if I go to this next slide, it shows our progress for the 140 meter and larger. So the total population of just the 140 meter and larger is, is anticipated to be about 25,000. And you can see in this, um, if you look for the the one kilometer, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but in the about the 12 o'clock position, um, you can see how much we found in terms of the overall percentage of that 25,000 estimated population, and then what we haven't found. So we've got about um, you know a small fraction. There's probably several one kilometer or larger that are still out there that we need to to find. A lot of them are probably close to the sun. Um, you can see how we found a good portion of the 300 to 300 meter to one kilometer, but there's there's a relatively decent portion um, shown in the gray hatch about one o'clock here um, that are still yet to be found. And then if you look for the 140 to 300 meter, um, we found about um, well 20 percent out of the 25,000, but there's a a large portion that is still yet to be found. So at the current discovery rate, it'll take us more than 30 years to complete the survey, um, which was which was supposed to be completed last year. And and one of the reasons for for the survey still being worked on is the the fact that a lot of these asteroids are very dark. And this animation, hopefully, is showing for everybody, um, demonstrates the difference in asteroid albedo. And you can see a very dark object is very difficult to pick up in the in the visual but in the infrared i'll let this play twice it becomes very visible um and some of these albedos you know they can range down to about three percent two to three percent reflectivity which is which is darker than the darkest coal that you're you'll find but in in the presence of infrared we can more easily see those objects so one of the the space-based um, missions that that we've we've long tried to uh, to implement is a space-based neo surveillance mission, and we finally have um, uh, it got approved for the key decision point B approved on June 11 for entry into preliminary design phase, and if the president's budget request for FY22 is fully funded we should be able to launch in 2026 if enacted. So the goal of this would be to find um, about 65% of the undiscovered 140 meter or larger in five years. And the goal is in 10 years um, for 90%. So we can, we can much more rapidly um, achieve the, the Georgie Brown survey goals. And the reason for that is its ability to see um, see these objects. And if you look at NEOWISE, you can see its field of regard. It's an Earth orbiting spacecraft, and it can only see outward from the sun. Um, the NEO surveillance mission has a much larger field of regard and can see out through these the red region that's shown here. So we can pick up a lot more of the of the uh, the space around the Earth where these near Earth asteroids will will come by. Um, just a few words again. Um, Detlef went through this quite quite extensively, but again, NASA is is coordinating um, the IWAN network, and ESA is chairing or, or chairs the uh, Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. Um, just to just to give you the breadth of the community, the the different um, 
signatories to the International Astronaut Asteroid Warning Network, IWAN. Um, you can see them. I won't call them all out, but we currently have 32 signatories, and you can learn more about it at iwan.net um, if you if you want to go look at that. Um, in terms of characterization, we've got the the NASA's Infrared Telescope Facility, um, which is a 3.2 meter telescope that provides uh, infrared spectrum from ground based, so we can characterize uh, the the composition and get a better understanding of the size of the objects. And we've got the use of planetary radar. Um, Goldstone is back at full power as of uh, the end of last year. Unfortunately, the, the Arecibo planetary radar um, in Puerto Rico has been um, de is, is in under control decommission after some failures of cables and subsequently the support cables um, creating some secondary damage back at the end of last year. So that, that's a big hit to, uh, to the planetary radar. Um, but we'll we'll continue to use the assets that we have, including Goldstone um, and um, and some other other facilities that we do have. the The important thing about planetary radar is that we can not only reduce the error in the orbital um, in in the orbit, we can get the orbits much much more accurately, but we can also get a good indication of the size and shape. And depending on the radar signal, we can get some very good information about the uh, what what the asteroid in particular looks like, as well as the fact that it might have binaries or even um, be a triple system. Um, and, and that's important from a mitigation standpoint if we ever have to, to deal with, with an asteroid. You can see uh, 2014 JO25 seems to have kind of a two-lobed um, contact binary appearance. So, you know, if whatever whatever deflection method that you use, you have to account for the fact that uh, they could be two, two rubble piles. Some of these others could just be piles um, of loosely uh, aggregated material. Um, so you have to be careful of that as well as the, the presence of secondaries. So as, as part of our, our efforts in the PDCO, there's also the asteroid threat assessment um, efforts. And that is to look at the effects of the asteroid coming into the Earth's atmosphere, um, characterize it, do entry simulations and testing. Um, along with you know all of the physics of the aerothermodynamics and the ablation and radiation radiation modeling, um, and then assess the effects, everything from the three D blast through the tsunami simulations through global effects. So um, this is an effort that's done uh, to try to estimate the probabilistic probabilistic risk of an asteroid impact um, and understanding what the possibilities are. Um, this chart just shows the reported fireballs by the U.S. government sensors um, from 1988 to 2021. So, uh, you know, about uh, 34 years now, 33 years. And you can see the impact energy. Um, if you use the Hiroshima bomb uh, that was detonated during World War II, you can see that's about the middle of the scale here. Um, and you can see the Chelyabinsk uh airburst that occurred um, back in 2013, as well as the Bering Sea uh, bolide that was picked up by, by satellites um, in 2018. And, and you can notice, you know, the, the impact phenomena is worldwide and varies in its uh, impact energy. So it's important to understand that every country in, in the world is, is subjected to the potential for an impact as well as Antarctica, as you can see at the bottom there. So I'll close with just a few words about impact mitigation techniques. Um, as, as Detlef mentioned earlier, you know, there's a variety of techniques. The most viable that we've, we've explored so far include kinetic impactors, gravity tractors, um, and nuclear explosive devices. And depending on the warning time and the size of the object really dictates what um, what type of technique you can you can apply? Uh, kinetic deflection is is the most mature and the most effective for short term warning. Um, <clears throat> we we understand how to um, direct a spacecraft or or a mass into the asteroid. Some of the things we don't understand is the effects of of that impact depending on the properties of the asteroid. We've also got the gravity tractor approach. Um, which I'll talk about just briefly in another slide here. 
Um, this particular one is called the Enhanced Gravity Tractor, and this is a concept that I, I actually worked with the Asteroid Redirect Mission. And the idea is that you use the gravitational attraction of the spacecraft plus material that's been collected from the asteroid, um, for example, a boulder or regolith, that amplifies the, the gravitational attraction. So as long as you can adjust the power and propellant load and the, uh, the amount of mass collected, you can increase the effectiveness of this technique because typically it takes um, a significant amount of time because the gravitational attraction um, is, is, is quite small. Um, deflection by nuclear explosive device. This just shows graphically how you can use a, a, an explosive, a nuclear detonation as a standoff. Um, it irradiates the shell, the outer surfaces of the asteroid that creates a blow off in, a, in the direction of the, where the detonation occurs. And then you get a reaction force on the asteroid, which, which will change its orbit. Um, and then finally, we've got the double asteroid redirection test, also called DART, um, that will do an impact of a, um, a kinetic impact demonstration on the moon of Didymos. So this is a binary system, and the, uh, the launch window opens in November of this year, and the impact is expected in the fall of next year. And so it's a controlled experiment so that we can understand the... Uh, you know whether our, our kinetic impact predictions are correct and improve our understanding of the physical properties of these uh, these impact and these high speed collisions. And so the binary target, what that allows us to do is is alter the orbit of the binary um, in a very measurable way, so we can test out uh, this technique and observe it from ground based telescopes. So that's it. I appreciate your time and attention. And um, we can, uh, if there's any questions, we'll take those a little bit later. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, Daniel. Then um, that was a very informative presentation. So thank you for this. Now, I want to introduce our poll with this. And we still have Alejandro uh, joining us right after this. So in April this year, we had a planetary defense conference where planetary defense experts got together and we share the latest developments in planetary defense missions and our plans for the future. Now, to understand and find, way, find ways to prevent a catastrophic collision of an incoming asteroid into Earth, we had a hypothetical asteroid exercise called PDC 2021, Planetary Defense Conference, PDC. I will share more information with you about this exciting hypothetical asteroid exercise. But now we are bringing a small example of this asteroid exercise to you. We have a poll where you can help us shape the future of planetary defense. Thank you, Ken, for sharing this one. So we are going to share the first question with you. Yes. That is our poll. So important, this is not real. <laughs> so don't start running and hiding, please. <laughs> this is just hypothetical. This is just for us to understand better how can we prepare in a case of a impact threat, okay? And I'm going to read the first question very quick. Ken, can you hear me? Ken? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay, great. So, can you show the poll? Can you show where they can go and um, and share their votes with us? Is sure, you want to do that? Okay, all right. Yes, please. So you will read the question, okay. I will read, I, ha I have that on my end. Thank you. So Ken, is, Ken will be showing us where you can go and join this exciting exercise with us. So this is a hypothetical warning. On April 19, 2021, newly discovered asteroid poses a risk with 
very low probability of impacting Earth. Now, our poll question, how did you react to this information? You have multiple choices and four of them and just choose one of them and we will let you know which one is the one that got more votes at the end. So stay tuned for the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Ken. We are going to our next speaker. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, so but do you want to speaker, wait? Yes. You want to wait for a few, uh, say one or two minutes for people to finish the poll question? Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So maybe another one minute. Um, another two minutes. Okay. Can they? So we can, then we can show the result of the poll if you want. Um, can they actually just do it on their own as we continue? Will that be possible? Sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, but if we but if we don't close the poll, what happened is uh, people okay. won't see the slides. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> then we will show those questions at the end. Okay. Um. Just let me know when when you feel it's time up. Oh, I, I can I guess now. <laughs> oh, you want to end now? Okay. Yeah, I just want to continue with the program because we have okay. another speaker. Yes. So I end the poll. Oh, you're and, not uh, ending the poll. You're just giving oh. us one question, right? And, yeah, just end that question. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I can show you what is the result now. That's fine. Don't. don't Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you, you can keep the, the answers at the end. How is that? Okay. Thank you. For, thank you, Ken. Okay, our next speaker. We have Alejandro Roman from the Paraguayan Space Agency. Alejandro, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. How you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Um, Please, um, my presentation is showing the screen, please. We can see your screen. My presentation screen? Yes, yes we can see it, Alejandro. Perfect, thank you. And you hear the sound, right? Yes. Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to thank you to, I, AIAA for the invitation to Nancy to Ken. Um, this is it is a, a big honor to to me and for my space agency to be here tonight. Uh, as the Paraguayan Space Agency is, is is a very new space agency. Let me show you the other end, the user end of this uh, global concern. Like uh, Dan says, uh, says uh, minutes ago. Um, well. Today we will cover uh, those topic, those topics, uh, Paraguayan Space Agency, and an uh, overview of uh, new space agencies. Uh, in contrast of uh, uh, of uh, uh, very important space agencies that's presented before, the necessity of cooperation, data sharing, and international coordination on planetary defense and other areas. Um, let me start. Why? Why a uh, small country or as a new space agency is worried about this uh, topic. Because uh, any object with a diameter of 50 meters or more is a potential hazard. And it can hit, it, it can hit uh, any, anywhere in the world. Um, and we need to be aware of, about the size, the composition, the, uh, also the trajectory of, of, of the object. Um, that's why it's very important for us to, to join this uh, uh, global effort to understand and to, 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 to work with the, with the data. We are living in a changing world. We are using satellite data right now in, in, in many areas, in disaster risk management. Uh, this is a video of, the, of uh, GNES from ESA that shows uh, how the satellite satellites help us to understand the phenomena in the in in, in the on the in the earth and give us a new perspective of, of our world 
you, we are using satellite data to measure, to understand, to forecast, and also to better response in case of uh, emergency in our, in, in our planet. And we are actively joined these efforts and it makes us um, a very success, success case that I will show you in minutes from now. This is a very good example of collaboration that my country has received from 20 space agencies around the world. Uh, satellites uh, are making, are providing, are producing data um, in, in 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, and 60, 365 days in a, in a year. And we are aware of the benefits of space in telecommunications, Earth observations, uh, navigation, um, the experimentation and the observation and exploration of the universe. And we also aware that the space science and technology is a generator of productive transformation accelerator of scientific, technological, industrial, commercial and social development in any country, especially in the developing country like Paraguay. We are developing two lines of, 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 of development right now in capacity building in basic space engineering and earth observations. And in earth observation, we started with emergencies. We have a very big flood in our country, affects 100,000 people. And we activate for the first time the, the international charter for space and major disaster. Like I said, with very good results. After the floodings, we start with the wildfires and also we activate again the international charter. We have a very good experience accessing the, the, the data that is available um, worldwide, uh, like uh, this one, this is a portal from a uh, space agency from Argentina, from ESA, from INPE Brazil, and also from NASA. We are working very close with NASA in many areas. And uh, we provide this information for the press, for the government and the general public, and it helps to uh, better the response in case of the emergency. Those are the, the space agency that's, that is working in disaster risk reductions and, and management. And we are working in the Earth Observation Laboratory and Geographic Information Systems that is starting to, to make uh, pilot projects in my country to improve some areas in, in not only in the academia or government, but also in the private sector. We are working also in the health department uh, on my country. Uh, this is uh, uh, some projects that we are developing with uh, universities there. Um, we, like I said, we are receiving a very strong collaboration from NASA in this area. That's why we started to see planetary defense as a new um, point of interest from our space agencies, because like we will see right now, we have uh, two uh, events uh, that um, needs all our attention and we have a lack of data. Um, this some, these are some evidence of uh, the collaboration that we are receiving from NASA and other space agencies. And we are participating very actively in, in, in many uh, uh, committees and organizations like UN Spider and GEO, AmeriGEO and UN NOSA and, and United Nations on IAF, where we are part of the Near Earth Object um, committee, also in the IAEA, on the uh, a regional organization, on the PDC, and we are working very, very close with institutions in our country. And um, in our space development, we developed our first satellite. And uh, this is the, the, the uh, uh, very important training for our country. Both uh, engineers go to Japan uh, with the help of JAXA. We and, and the Kyushu Institute of, of, of Technology, we developed our first satellite that was launched Five, this year four, from the world of Adam. This is for us one. a very big step. We have engine ignition. And this, this event was broadcasted by a local television and was seen by 2.9 million people in, an, in a 7 million. Uh, inhabitant country is a very big number, uh, is a very big impact for a small satellite. Uh, we are using this as like uh, increasing our awareness for, for the importance of the space science and technology 
the most important uh, mission from this satellite is capacity building. And we are working, one of the missions has to be with, uh, with a local community, uh, indigenous community, and a public health. We have a, a disease that is transmitted by the bug, and we install sensors in the field to detect the bug and to inform to the health authorities to, to provide countermeasures. Um, we are working with an infrastructure also. This is our operation monitoring and control center. It's a very new uh, control center. And in 10th of March of 2018, we have a third stage of a rocket body re-entry in our country. This is an image from our, from our capital. And it lands 100 meters from a house. Uh, there you, you see a hydrazine tank that we rescue, rescue, and it lands 100 meters from a house. In this case, it's a rocket uh, body. Uh, can be a, a meteorite, uh, can be another object. That's why we are, we are very interested in this, in, in this area. Um, for example, the 9th of May, of May in 2021, we all follow the 22-ton rocket body trajectory. Fortunately, it lands in Maldives Island. And we are we are starting to 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 understand how uh, this international collaboration works, and we are studying the the alerts process in other countries, like in in, in this case NASA. And this is the report uh, that Dance uh, shows us. Uh, this is a new is is a new version in January 2021. Um, it's very important for to us for us the point three the notification to foreign governments and this notification has to be also with uh, data to follow the possibly possible uh, impact zones and also the international astro warnings network we will start right now to join uh, to make the process to join this uh, international uh, effort the key word here is mitigation sometimes it's not possible to deflect or to 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 to, to it, it, we, we need to work to mitigate the the possible effects and finally let me go faster from these uh, slides because of the time finally we are working in in in, in education outreach and international presence we have we are working in, in we are in presence in in many countries in colombia russia france united states peru mexico united arab brazil chile united kingdom paraguay and for the future we are working we are looking for new alliance new challenges new projects and in conclusion in three years our new space agency has joined the most important forum on space and we have part of the most important events on the space and we are working with the most important space agencies in the world. We are on the same planet and we need to share knowledge, data and coordinate efforts on, Pacific, on planetary defense and other areas. We need uh, planetary defense and new education, communication and outreach to keep the public informed. And we need to work together to act together and we will be stronger together. Thank you very much. I, I do not hear you. Nancy, your mic, your microphone is, is off. Thank you. Alejandro, no. thank you for the presentation. It was very informative, uh, very informative. And yes, so now we are almost at the end of our presentation. So what about if we go to the Q&A? Ken, how are we doing with the time? Uh, oh, yeah, we still have some time. Yeah, that's uh, about time. So but okay. you, you haven't, how about you? You haven't started your presentation yet. Uh, yes, I'm just going to go through it quickly. How is that? And then we're just going to go into the Q&A. And how about the uh, the other poll questions? Uh, would you like to do that at the end? Okay. All right. So I'm pu putting up your, uh, your, your slides. Yes. And I'm just going to go through it. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Can you hear me? Okay, 
So, so far, we have discussed about some of the space missions, and we have learned about the involvement of our space agencies in planetary defense. So moving forward in this presentation, we will continue learning about other organizations and interagency cooperation between the different organizations involved in planetary defense. And at the end of this presentation, I will quickly share some resources for you. Okay, we can go to the next one. I am the vice chair of the International Astronautical Federation Committee on Near Earth Objects. And mainly I co-lead uh, the committee's uh, several activities along with initiatives and several academic projects to increase, increase the participation and the visibility and international interagency collaboration of our members. Okay, next. All right, here we go. So we know that an asteroid hitting Earth is a real threat. While the chance of an impact could be small, the potential consequences of such an impact can be severe, meaning that the sensible risk reduction measures should be taken on. While a great part of the conversation among my colleagues and many other specialists in planetary defense and the NEO community in general, goes around the technology needed to protect planet Earth, we have to look to other important components. As you can see in this graph, the synergy between space missions, interagency collaboration, cooperation, and communicating with other professionals and the public. We can go to the next one. Okay, a quick recap. Now we know what is I want. Right? <laughs> so I want is the International Asteroid Warming Network. It was established to create, again, an international group of organizations involved in detecting, tracking, characterizing NEOs, NEOs, near Earth objects. And I want is tasked with developing a strategy using well defined communication plans and protocols to assist government and analysis of asteroid impact consequences and in the planning of mitigation responses. Of course, UNOSA has a scope to define a more concrete cooperation with I-1 in the areas of communication with the general public, dissemination of neo-related information, early warnings, and member states capacity building activities through UN Spider Network. What is UN Spider Network? Stay tuned. We're going to learn about it later on in this quick presentation. Can we go to the next one, please? Aha, same page. What is same page? Yes, a Space Mission Planning Advisory Group. Remember that, we're gonna quiz you at the end. <laughs> the primary purpose of same page is to prepare for an international response to NeoTrek through the exchange of information development of options for collaborative research and mission opportunities, and to conduct near threat mitigation planning activities. All right, let's continue to the next one, please. Mm -hmm. And this is how all of them look like together, okay? The United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, you know some, is the secretary to COPS and works with the member states and international organizations to create, to increase the efforts in order to fortify their cooperation in space activities. UNOSA also acts as the secretary of SEMPH and works with both I1 and SEMPH in addressing planetary defense global issues. We can go to the next one. Yes, UN SPIDER, and it stands for a Space-Based Information for Disaster Management and Emergency Response. The United Nations Platform for Space Information and Disaster Management and Emergency Response, UN SPIDER, was established in 2006 under the United Nations Office of Aerospace Affairs. Now you know what is that, UNOSA. You know, <laughs> 
develop solutions to develop solutions to address the limited access in developing countries to a specialized technology that can be essential in the management of disaster and reduction of disaster risk. So some of the aspects um, involved in UN Spider uh, is remote sensing for Earth observations, satellite communication, and global navigation satellite system. All of them contribute to a more effective disaster risk management and emergency response. The UN Spider mandate to enable developing countries to use all type of space-based information and all phases of disaster management cycle, including prevention, preparedness, early warning, response, and reconstruction. All right, we can go to the next one. Aha, planetary defense, yes. So the Planetary Defense Conference is a biannual conference that brings together more experts to discuss the threat of Earth to Earth posed by asteroids and comets and the actions that, me, that might be taken to deflect or disrupt a threatening object. We also have, of course, as I mentioned before, the hypothetical asteroid exercise called PDC, PDC for Planetary Defense Conference. 2021. This impact scenario is part of the conference, and we all together, scientists, engineers, and various experts sit down together and we talk about how can we change the direction of a potential astral impact. And this conference also includes panels, discussions, and individual presentations, as well as poster exhibitions. So if you want to learn more about the Planetary Defense Conference, please go to the official website, uh, either at Planetary Defense Conference, or you can go through UNOSA. Uh, next, please. Aha. So in April this year, our Planetary Defense Conference was online due to COVID-19 and we obviously share um, all the different developments and, and new advances in planetary defense missions. Now this has to do with a hypothetical asteroid exercise as I mentioned before called the PDC. Uh, I will be sharing more information about it later. Continue please. Can we go to the next one? So an intent to allow scientists time to prepare for such a situations, if that were to arise, let me explain this scenario briefly. So it's a mysterious asteroid from about 45 million miles away coming and is coming toward Earth and is expected to hit the planet in six months. Let's go to the next one, please. Which, yes, <laughs> with, with each, Passing hour, the scientists began developing information. Finally, on a day two, they confirmed that the asteroid impact will happen in six months across a vast region, which includes Europe and North America. By the end of the week, they said with some degree of certainty that the asteroid will hit between Germany and Czech Republic. Now, if you want to know what we concluded after the last Planetary Defense Conference, stay for our Q&A. So let's go to the next one. I might just skip. Um, thank you. Can we skip that one? Next, please. Yes. All right. So these are, these are just the, the, the beautiful dinosaurs. <laughs> and all I can tell you about them is that um, so we are confident. Scientists are confident that a large asteroid crash into it approximately 60 million years ago, leading to the extinction of the dinosaurs and some other life forms. Now, the dinosaurs didn't have a space program, but we do. <laughs> Next. Thank you. So I'm going to mention a few uh, very important um, um, 
events in, in regards to, to in asteroid impacts, meteorite impacts, and planetary events. Okay, so this one is the Tunguska event. Uh, it was a massive 12 megaton explosion that occurred near Kuramegia, <laughs> Tunguska River in um, Russia in the morning of June 30 in 1908. If you want to learn more about it, you can join us for our next presentation where we can tell you all about this event. Um, yeah, let's go to the next one, please. Aha! And the Chalawinsky in, of course, Russia 2013 um, was largest, uh, the largest witness meteorite fall since the Tunguska, which is the one that we just mentioned, that it was in 1908. So Tunguska, 1908, Chalawinska, which is this picture, is 2013. And it was in Russia. We go to the next one, please. Yes, and this is just um, for you to learn more about what has happened and what is going to happen uh, in planetary defense missions. So this is a very nice uh, chart that you can study and learn a little bit more about the previous um, asteroid missions and the ones that are coming up in the near future, including the ones that you already um, heard about from our experts, which is um, Hayabusa, Dart, Kira, and we have the um, Neo Scott, Psychic, and, and yeah, Lucy. <laughs> so this is for you to do some, this is homework. Let's go to the next one. Aha, so yeah, so this is the, the Chalawinski um, uh, effect. This is what happened, and and this is and this is a disaster that we actually, that Russia actually experienced due to the uh, shock wave uh, of the impact in 2013. Let's go to the next one. Aha! All right, we're almost at the end. <laughs> so, resources. Now you heard about UN Spider. You also learn about ESA, the International Space, um, the European Space Agency, same page, I1, and of course, the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, NASA. And we have Asteroid Day. I want to talk about Asteroid Day very quick because they have an amazing outreach plan and an amazing educational plan uh, for disseminating planetary defense information. So if you want to learn more about Astro Day, please go to the official Astro Day website. And we celebrate Astro Day every June 30. And if you want to, if you ever want to join us in any of our presentations for Astro Day, you can email me and I will be able to give you some information on how you can join other different um, educational initiatives. We always uh, like to welcome everybody that wish to learn about planetary defense. And of course, please go to the official websites of all of these amazing organizations if you wish to learn more about their activities winning planetary defense and um, protecting planet Earth from asteroids. Can we go to the next one, please? Aha, uh -huh. yeah, this was me, Nancy C. Wilson. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. And this was the Space Agencies and Global Collaboration for Planetary Defense. What an amazing adventure. Now you know all the basics about planetary defense in only one session. So we are ready for a probably a quick Q&A, Ken. And yes, if you want to contact me, please, you can contact me at nancyplanetarydefense at gmail.com. Yes, thank you, Ken. Now, <laughs> can we bring everyone in? Do I still have all my speakers?
Hi, Dan. Yeah, here. <laughs> okay. So, how is everybody doing? Are we excited? Are we excited about our Q and A? Okay. So, Ken. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Do we have? Yes. Do we have any questions uh, for our speakers? Uh, I saw there was one question in the Q&A okay. box, but I think that lab already answered it. Uh, but unless that, that lab, if you want to repeat the question and uh, tell people what's the question, and you can uh, repeat your answer if you like. Yeah, we had two us? questions. And the first one indeed was about same page. And the question was, um, if who, who determines who can be a member? Well, what we did is with, as with every other international organization, we have something called terms of reference. And if you go to the same page, web page, smpag.net, there is on the left side a menu which links you to the terms of reference. I clarified directly to, to answer the question here that it, membership is indeed a bit restricted. We restrict it to space agencies or space offices that have a government behind them. So currently we do not have private companies participating there. Um, then the question was, is there any veto right? Well, decisions are taken by consensus. So implicitly that means, you know, if, if somebody says, no, I don't like this, then we are not having consensus. Anybody could have that opinion. So that was the first question, and the second one was for Makoto. Uh, actually, Dr. Yoshikawa, I think the uh, same person who asked you that question type another question in the Q&A. So maybe you can uh, first repeat your answer to his first question, and then uh, read uh, answer his second question that is posted in the Q&A box right now. It was uh, asked by Mr. Uh, Holger Eisenberg. Did you see yes. it? Yes. Dr. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So uh, the question is, as the Rosetta mission observed, a small reprusion effect due to the plasma and or EM field, electromagnetic field around a comet 67P. Was something similar surprising detected around Ryugu? Uh, that is a question. And the answer is uh, no, uh, we did not uh, detect such uh, effect. Of course, we uh, studied the uh, orbit of uh, spacecraft in detail, but uh, we did not detect such an effect. That is my answer. <clears throat> yeah, uh, Holger put another question in the Q&A. Did you see it in the Q&A box? He has another question on you, uh, you, you do. Did you? Okay, uh, yes. Dr. Yoshikawa, can you see the Q&A box or do you want me to read it to you? Uh, no, I just uh, answer the question, but uh, do you have another question? Yeah, he type another question. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I, ah, okay. Maybe I, ah, okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Another question on Ryugu. Does some result exist already about the specific density to of the boulders and the pebbles visible on the surface of Ryugu? Are those like stones on Earth or much less dense? Ah, okay. <clears throat> yes. Uh, uh, from the data of uh, 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 TIR, thermal infrared measure, uh, we found the temperature change is very, <clears throat> uh, I mean, uh, thermal inertia is very small. So we think the uh, borders on Ryugu, the, the density of the border of Ryugu is very small. However, now we have the samples of Ryugu and uh, it seems that <clears throat> the, the rock of the sample is not so uh, low density. So now we are uh, studying uh, both 
remote sensing data and uh, uh, sample data. So I think after sample analysis, we will have some conclusion. Okay. <clears throat> okay, excellent. Ken, do we have another question? Uh, right now, I not yet. Uh, let me see. I do have one. <laughs> okay, go ahead. If not, we can. Um, Holger, I think you have that. Uh, do you want to speak out, Holger? Mr. Eisenberg, do you want to speak out? Uh, oh, no. Yeah, many thanks, uh, Dr. Yoshikawa, for answering uh, those were my two questions. And it's uh, interesting to hear about the specific density. Uh, that's a really interesting result the differences from the remote sensing and the uh, actual sample analysis. And I will follow up looking on internet publications then to uh, read more details later then. Thank you. Hi, uh, hi everyone. So uh, you're welcome to click raise hand. Uh, so you will be able to speak out your question or comment. Uh, so while we're waiting for more people to raise hand or type your question in the Q&A &A box. Uh, so Nancy, you, you go ahead. You want to say something? Yes because I think this is an important uh, information for our audience. Why are we using kinetic, kinetic impactors here and not something else? Who would like to answer that? Dan? Dan, your microphone. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. Yes. Okay, sorry, my system was not set to the right microphone. Um, yeah, so the kinetic impactor technique is, is arguably the most mature of the uh, planetary defense techniques. Um, we've, we've, uh, we've impacted a comet, we've not done an asteroid yet. Um, so, but the targeting, um, and the ability to to perform a kinetic impact is is relatively straightforward. It's not it's not a simple effort. It takes a lot of careful planning and engineering. Um, but some of the other techniques, um, for example, a, a nuclear explosive device has its uh, its constraints um, that are rooted in the the, the um, space act and. The peaceful uses of outer space. There's interpretations of of using any sort of uh, nuclear explosive um, is is an issue. So that's that makes a difficulty there. And um, another technique like the the gravity tractor, the enhanced gravity tractor, we were going to demonstrate that with the arm mission before it was canceled. Um, so right now this is the, the the current, but I can see in the future testing out different techniques. Um, as we learn more about about the uh, the nature of these asteroids and the effectiveness of of DART, um, you know, it, it's it's relatively um, straightforward in principle. But when you actually interact with the surface, and depending on how it hits and what the material is, um, we should get a better idea of what we call beta the the um, uh, enhancement factor that's associated with a, a high-speed kinetic impact. So, so that's why we're doing it. And, uh, and again, the mission is is ready to launch, and uh, we should have results uh, relatively quickly to see how effective it is. Thank you, Dan. And I do have another question, and um, this is for uh, Tetra. Are you still with us? So I would like to know what challenges were experienced by uh, the agency in terms of working together in a mission such as DART and HERA? Well, DART and HERA were set up in a very intelligent way that basically they are independent missions. Mm -hmm. And of course there are, for example, uh, contributions say for the DART mission that Dan mentioned, there is a little CubeSat spacecraft, a very small one, which comes from Italy. There's the other way around. And this is the way we work together. 
it's always very important to define what we call the interfaces very clearly. So like for the CubeSat, if this has to have a battery power from the main spacecraft, you need a connector. There are many technical details there, but we're used to, to working on these things, even in Europe, even within our own uh, European countries, right? There is stuff that comes from one country, from the other country. So I think this is just something we're really used to working together. Thank you. Excellent. Ken, how are we doing with our q and Yeah, time? very good, very good. Keep going. Okay. Excellent. I think there are two questions in the Q&A box. Please One by George. Uh, Dr. Childers, let's, uh, Dr. Childers, uh, let's let him allow him, uh, uh, invite him to speak up. Uh, so Dr. Childers, please, uh, you can unmute yourself and speak up. Yes, hello, thank you for um, uh, these great presentations. I enjoyed them all. I had a question for Dan, uh, and that was for the um, uh, ion beam deflection technique in which you would uh, simply aim the ion beam exhaust from your, uh, you know, your xenon thrusters uh, and, and over time, you could deflect the asteroid. I, um, and my question to you, Dan, or comment, is that I think it would be a stronger push than the gravity tractor technique. Gravity is awfully weak, and you have to be awfully close, whereas I think you can be farther away with an ion beam. And, and then if you have enough xenon, you could actually fire you know, that, that beam for um, months or even years uh, at the asteroid. So comments on that, please. Yeah, Paul, thanks. Um, yeah, that is a definitely another technique. And again, um, the, the ion beam deflection is, is really like a series of high speed kinetic impactors. Every, every uh, ion that comes from, for example, if you use xenon as your propellant, um, it, it impacts the surface and, and causes a, a, a small kinetic impact. Um, there, there's, I, I think it's important to, to test and compare different techniques. One of the issues with the ion beam deflection is, you know, maintaining the, the position of the spacecraft because as, as the thruster um, is activated and is actually pushing against the, uh, the asteroid or in, impacting the asteroid, the, the spacecraft will move away from the asteroid if, if you don't maintain its its position. So do you have a second thruster to, to hold its position? Um, do you do seri a series of maneuvers where you get closer as, as the effectiveness of the ion beam changes? So there's there's a lot of technical implementations and, and certainly, um, you know, with, for example, with the asteroid redirect mission, we, we could have looked at actually both of those because we had an ion, um, uh, solar electric propulsion system um, on board. So I think it's definitely possible to compare and contrast them in, a, in, a, in an experiment at some point. Yeah, and just to follow on, uh, I would, I would uh, think it would be designed with equal and opposite ion beams in either direction. And one is pointing at the asteroid, the other one balances so that the spacecraft doesn't move, I think, uh, or move much. I think but uh, I think I like your answer and I think it should be demonstrated. I, I think it's a powerful technique. Yeah, the, the issue, Paul, with, with having a thruster pointed away is you're, you're basically consuming twice as much propellant. Um, so that, that's where it needs to be contrasted. And, and I agree that the gravity tractor by itself is, is a very small effect, but the idea of the enhanced gravity tractor where you're collecting mass from the asteroid um, it can, can significantly amplify that gravitational pull um, by the spacecraft. Again, as long as you have the propellant and the thrust capability to maintain maintain distance. And you are absolutely correct. Getting closer is always good, but it's good for both techniques. Okay, so in case uh, people didn't uh, uh, realize, actually Dr. Paul Childers is the director of the uh, NASA JPL Center of Near Earth Object Studies. Uh, so she, he's an important leader in this uh, uh, object and a world expert. Uh, so the next question, I think, uh, uh, George, Mr. George Weeman, uh, do you want, George, do you want to speak out? 
Hi, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I think my question is somewhat superseded by the, by the previous question by a much more qualified person. Um, but it, it occurred to me that if you're in a position to have the technology to um, essentially, as you say, attract mass, which is a, a very simple way of, uh, a, sorry, very sophisticated way of saying you're taking you know, something off the asteroid and, and essentially uh, pulling it to your spacecraft, that seems to me to be a fairly sophisticated capability. Why not simply push on the spacecraft directly? Um, if we've demonstrated the ability to touch down um, relatively softly uh, a few times now, why not just touch down and uh, make an effort to just push against the spacecraft and develop that technology? And the question then, of course, is that there are others out there who have speculated on the feasibility of at some point manipulating or even capturing a NEO into uh, predefined orbits. So I was curious if, if those um, other hypothetical studies uh, are dovetailing with what you all are looking at. If I can, I can start real quick and maybe Detlef wants to follow up. Um, no, George, that's a good, a very good question. One of the issues with um, the pusher solution is that not only do you have to contact the asteroid, but you have to maintain contact. So, and you have to make sure that you have a stable connection. Um, and then the other big issue is the rotation state of the asteroid. Um, you want to apply the deflection in a particular direction, usually along the velocity direction is the most efficient. And if, you're, if your asteroid is tumbling or in, you know, in, a, in a particular state, you have to wait and you have to pulse your, your pusher, your thrusters of your spacecraft when the, the rotation is in the proper position or when the spacecraft that's pushing it's in the proper position, which depending on the rotation state of the asteroid can, can really reduce its efficiency. Whereas something that's standing off like a gravity tractor or ion beam deflection it can position itself in the proper place in order to provide the, the proper change in velocity. Um, and, and, and again, also it's the, the duration of the contact and the anchoring um, that might need to be done versus say just collecting material, which could be done very quickly um, without an extended surface contact, for example. Thanks, I and appreciate I that. That, that. That's very much a highlighting, uh, uh, I'll call it, uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional thinking versus four-dimensional thinking, uh, the aspect of uh, objects not being static in space. Yeah, static um, dimensionally and time-wise too. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay, so uh, we have Dr. Stan Rosen. He's our AWA Associate Fellow. He's a professor of Defense Acquisition University. Uh, so Stan, go ahead. You can unmute yourself and speak out your question. Dr. Rosen? Can you hear me? I don't know if this microphone's working. Yeah, yes, we can very hear good. You. Yeah, the, the question is written there is just a query really, and that is, uh, we could put a very large aperture sensor array on the lunar surface and potentially collect information on very dim targets or very accurately positioned targets that we couldn't do with a smaller sensor system. And I just wonder if you know, anyone knows whether that makes any sense in the context of detecting or tracking threats to the Earth. Yes. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Okay. I, yeah. Or Detlef, do you want to go ahead? I, I, I've answered a couple already. I want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was thinking, thinking about this question while you answered the previous question. I mean, if, if I have a large telescope or, or sensor system, which I have to launch from the earth, then I wonder why I would want to land it on the moon again. It might be easier to just leave it in space. That would very be very stable, sta stable baseline between the sensors. If yeah, you distribute the sensor array over, over I, many I, hundreds of kilometers. 
I was I was involved in studies that we did a few years ago for landing on the moon. And actually, you know, it's 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 easier not to land, <laughs> to put it simply. So it could be yeah, you have a more stable platform, but then you pay the price of having to go down into the gravity well of the moon. So I think this this would deserve a more detailed study. We were looking at, for example, putting uh, radio telescopes on the backside of the moon, on the far side of the moon, so away from the Earth, where you avoid contamination of radio signals from the Earth. So that's a good thing. If you put telescopes there to look at asteroids, then of course you are always have to make sure you don't look into the sun. So it's a complicated thing. That's what I'm saying. I don't have, I, I would not be able to say right now there's an advantage or a disadvantage. I can come up with both. And typically we do this by having a study where industry or also internal experts think about this discuss it. So it's a nice question. I'll keep that in mind. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, now I'll just add, Stan, you know, there, I, I think Detlef is right. There's, there's pros and cons. You've got a stable platform. You do have to deal with the dust on the, on the lunar surface. You have to actually land it. But at the same time, if you want a long term facility, you don't have um, propellants for attitude control and desaturation of, of control moment gyros, for example. So in the long run, it, it potentially could be beneficial. It just depends on how long the facility is, is on the surface. On the other hand, it also, like Detlef said, it, it takes 28 days for the moon to, to rotate with, helios, with respect to heliocentric space um, because it's, it's phase locked with the Earth um, in, its, in its orbit. So you, know, you can only see part of the sky you might have to have multiple facilities and you have, you know, the, the sunlight um, if it's optical um, or infrared that uh, you have to contend with. You need a shutter. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Excellent. So, Ken, yes. how are we doing with our time? Um, I think we are fine. You know, we started a little bit uh, late uh, for waiting okay. for more people to join. Uh, so, yeah, no, if, you, I see. if you want to take a few more questions, we can do that, or you want to uh, say okay. something, that's fine too. Yes. So is there, is there any more questions? Because we love answering questions. Yes. Uh, let me remind people again. Uh, hi, folks. This is a great opportunity. So you're welcome to uh, click raise hand to speak out your question, uh, or you can type your question in the Q&A. Okay, so I'm going to continue with the next question. Uh, okay. And yes, so about the poll, because we're lacking of time, we are going to keep the poll on the website. It's going to be on the a a i -A, -A, a l a website. So please, after this presentation, go ahead and go to the website. Uh, Ken, will you be able to share the link of the website where anybody uh can go and Yes, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow we will send the um, an email to the uh, attendees and the registrants for the uh, or the link for the poll, and we will also send everyone the uh, the recording and the podcast uh, links for a video recording and podcast uh, tomorrow. Okay, excellent. Those are great news. Yes, so we are looking forward to see your answers and please continue uh, participating in the polls. We have three questions and um, various um, answers and we need to know how, what you think so we can continue moving forward. And this is a collaborative effort and we need to learn from each other. So, okay, do we have another question? I see, uh, not yet. Okay, so I'm going to continue with my question. Um, and this is going to be for each of our speakers as we are moving forward into, into the end of our special session on planetary defense. So we are going to start with uh, that one. That one. What is next for the European Space Agency? 
Could you share with us? We have uh, well big ambitions. We are currently discussing something we call flagship programs, where we are thinking of of large projects that we want to discuss with the leaders of our European member countries. Uh, in the area of planetary defense, the future is that we are working on a survey telescope. We heard from them that they are very much focusing on discovering these objects, which is something where Europe is not yet very strong. We are mainly focusing on following up objects that have been discovered by other survey telescopes. We are finishing a telescope one meter aperture, but with a very, very large field of view which is 150 times larger than the apparent size of the moon in the sky. And that hopefully we will become operational towards the end of next year then. And then we can also contribute to discovering new objects. Excellent. Thank you. Alejandro, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so why don't you share with us what is next for the Paraguayan Space Agency? Well, um, for us, it's to continue learning. We are just in the starting point to join the international efforts in many areas, including planetary defense, and, and to develop uh, more lines of cooperation with the developed countries, space agencies. That's our main goal. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, yes, thank you. So, uh, what is next for the Jackson? Uh, yes, so now we are doing the extended mission of HAFSA 2, but uh, uh, personally, I, I would like to uh, plan another uh, asteroid mission. And uh, I think some JAXA people uh, have very strong interest to make uh, such an asteroid mission. So, I do hope we will have another mission. And, and in addition to this, uh, I hope uh, we also contribute to the uh, observation of NEO. So at this point, uh, we would like to develop a, a method to detect to uh, uh, to detect small asteroids. So I think that is uh, 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 our next uh, target. Thank you very much. Thank you, Makoto. And of course, we have NASA. And then, what is next for NASA? Yeah, so Nancy, I think, I mean, NASA is, is still involved in a variety of aspects um, in the detection and characterization. Um, the NEO surveillance mission, um, an, an orbital um, infrared telescope is certainly high on the list that um want to see implemented in the you know we've been we've been trying to get a, a space-based ir telescope for for decades now and and we're getting close to that um the dart mission as i mentioned is going to occur and, and hera will follow up with observations on the isa side um and uh you know testing out different techniques um is is something that you know we'd like to uh to work on um, and of course, supporting the planetary radar and, um, you know, uh, it's, it's complicated in terms of replacing Arecibo, um, but, but that's a, a goal is to uh, increase our planetary radar capability as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I want to say thank you to all my, to all my speakers today. Thank you for all, um, JAXA, ESA, NASA, and of course, the Paraguayan Space Agency to be with us. And of course, I'm here with the uh, International Astronomical Federation Committee on Near Earth Objects. And my focus is uh, on communication, education, and public outreach. So, and this is why my presentation usually goes through the basics of planetary defense, because at the end, planetary defense is for all. Um, so, Ken, if we don't have any more questions, so I there's a question the in a Q&A box, and okay. I think that's a recurring question. I think people are concerned or curious about the Chinese. So okay, this question is, are, are the Chinese 
studying planetary defense? Well, on the side of the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group, China is represented amongst almost 15 other space agencies. So they are there, yes. Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, Ken, you let me know. Um, well, I don't see any question here. Okay. Excellent. So it has been a pleasure to be with all of you. And thank you so much for joining us today. It has been an amazing experience for all of us because it's always um, a part of our work, regardless we are focused on the technical or non-technical aspects of planetary defense. It is important and vital to communicate uh, with, with the community at large the NEO and the planetary defense community, but also to continue educating the general public about planetary defense, planetary defense efforts, missions, and how can we be better prepared for a risk of impact. So today we had JAXA, ESA, NASA, and the Paraguayan Space Agency, along with uh, representatives from the NEO committee. And we are very happy to have you today. I'm going to let my speakers give one last statement as a goodbye. And we are going to be closing the session for today. Uh, Declan, any last, um, anything that you would like to share last with our audience? I, I think it's important to make it clear to the audience that there are many Amateur astronomers are actually contributing to the field. We work Absolutely, closely yes. with hobby or citizen scientists that help in following up asteroids. We have an amateur astronomer who wrote some software for simulating some survey observations where they discovered new objects. And I think that's definitely nice. It's one of the areas where the public can contribute to what we're doing. Thank you. Um, Alejandro? Yes, just uh, to say thank you again. It, it was a, a pleasure and honor to, to share this, this uh, conversation with so distinguished colleagues. Um, I think we are all together on this. Uh, we need to, to, to continue working together to, to have this um, information available for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. And of course, Pacaro, anything that you would like to share last with our audience? Yes, thank you. So uh, I also enjoyed today's event very much. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me today. And uh, uh, I also think planetary defense is very important. So uh, uh, I want to continue this work uh, in, in future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Makoto. And of course, then, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Yeah, first of all, I'd just like to thank everybody for, for spending the evening with us and, uh, and discussing planetary defense. Um, I think I kind of echo um, without what Alejandro was saying, we're, we're all in this together. Um, you know, we don't know where, if, if we have an impact, where that will actually occur. It can happen anywhere in the entire world. Um, we don't get to choose uh, that. So we all have to work together internationally um, and across organizations to, to, to prevent that, uh, that type of catastrophe from happening. Um, you know, what we've seen with the, with the COVID virus is that we are a global community and what happens in, in one area of the country can have a direct impact on another area. So we have to keep that in mind as we, we try to mitigate the, uh, the effects of, of comets and asteroids hitting the earth. And, uh, and remember that it is a, it is a global hazard that we, we all have a responsibility um, to help, help prevent that type of a, of a catastrophe from happening. So thanks. Okay, thank you everyone. And I'm gonna give you some last words. This was Nancy C. Walson and of course, 
as we briefly talk about the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs didn't have a space program, right? So that's one thing to keep in mind. And the next is that an asteroid impact is the only natural disaster that can be prevented. So the work that we do together is important, not just to protect planet from asteroids, but to continue creating community uh, around the globe. So if you wanna join us and learn more about planetary defense, please go to the trusted sources as the organizations that we had um, that we had shared with you today and continue joining our presentations. There is more to come. And thank you for having us today. Thank you to the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Astronautics LA Division. And we are looking forward to the next one. So we have more surprises for you. Join our poll. It's going to be on the website. So we're looking forward to see what information you are going to share with us through the poll. And please stay tuned to the next session in Planetary Defense with our amazing speakers. And thank you so much to everyone that joined us today. Have an amazing day. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good, night. Good, night. Good thank afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, thanks again for everyone. Enjoy the uh, event and the evening. And once again, next Wednesday, we have another event that is relevant to uh, planetary defense. And that I just mentioned about the astronomers that uh, uh, around the world that uh, help the planetary defense. And uh, next Wednesday, we have the co-discoverer of the famous shoemaker Levy line comet. Uh, Dr. David Levy is going to give a presentation. Uh, it's kind of a mixture of, of, of his uh, kind of other part of uh, expertise that's the English literature, Shakespeare. And uh, he's going to talk about his uh, uh, thoughts and struggle between uh, English literature, poetry, and uh, his uh, you know, love and passion for watching the night sky. Uh, so he's, uh, because the two shoemakers actually have already passed away, Carolyn passed away last month. So David, Dr. David Levy is actually the only remaining uh, discoverer of this famous comet. And uh, as you know, this comet hit uh, Jupiter in 1993. Uh, so it's a great opportunity. We, we, we spent quite some effort to invite him. So this is a wonderful opportunity. So if you could please join us uh, next Wednesday uh, around the same time, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time. All right. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us. Please uh, uh, look, look, look forward to the email we're going to send you for the polls and uh, the recording podcast. And also let us know what AIWA can do uh, to contribute to the effort for uh, the planetary defense. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, Nancy. You all Thank wonderful. you, Ken. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye -bye. bye bye. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone. Bye, bye bye. Bye everyone. Planetary defense for all. <laughs> yes, forever. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Ken. Have a good night. You too. <laughs>